My name's Heather, and um, I'm going to talk about skin and soft tissue infections in the emergency department, and that's obviously a huge topic that I can't possibly cover all of, so I chose some very specific kind of objectives that I'm going to cover based on some cases that I saw. And I'd also like to thank Dr. John for joining us. Um, he's a medical microbiologist and the medical director of infection control, um, so hopefully he can answer questions people have about local antibiotic resistance and antibiotic choices. And so... Um, the last four weeks I spent on Hulk and on Hulk you do plastic surgery call so I saw a lot of soft tissue infections on plastic surgery call and it left me with a lot of questions about what we do because there's some differing opinions from um, our point in the surgery standpoint regarding antibiotics. So um, I wanted to talk about diagnosis of abscesses, um, MRSA coverage for purulent skin and soft tissue infections, antibiotics after IND, primary organisms causing cellulitis, and the role of ceftriaxone in treating moderate to severe cellulitis. So the first case I'm going to talk about is a call I got from the community about a 25-year-old male who presented complaining of left arm pain. <coughs> and he admitted to injecting crystal meth into his forearm and thinks he might have missed. And uh, he had, a, from what the eMERGE doc told me, a large area of erythema and swelling on his left forearm. And the eMERGE doc then texted me a picture to show me what he meant. And I'll show you that in a minute. So the community ER doc did a point of care ultrasound to confirm presence of an abscess in that guy's forearm. And then he called us because he thought that the abscess that he did see was really deep and he didn't want to go after it and thought the patient might benefit from an OR. So this is a picture he sent me. And he was right. We ended up getting a formal ultrasound and that guy went to the OR for uh, drainage and washout. But it made me wonder how much better is point of care <coughs> ultrasound than our own clinical exam when it comes to diagnosing abscesses. And there's actually a few papers out there about this. I'm only going to talk about two of them. So this was a prospective study done in California on 135 patients in an academic teaching hospital. And they included any patients with a chief complaint of cellulitis or abscess, but it had to be uh, keratinizing epithelium, so you couldn't, they couldn't use oral sites. Um, and the residents and staff were provided with 30 minutes of ultrasound training. And that sort of varied between studies. Sometimes it was as little as 15 minutes. Sometimes it wasn't really a formal training period. And uh, they used the linear probe, which um, when I was at St. Joe's Urgent Care, I couldn't find one um, to use on that abscess. I don't know if it's there or not. But um, anyways, this was a, what they um, defined as an abscess on ultrasound. So an anechoic or hypoechoic structure with poorly defined borders. It's usually spherical in shape. I don't know how well that projects. But this is going to help me. Okay, there. So poorly defined borders, usually spherical in shape, although it doesn't have to be, with a variable amount of internal echoes. And then this is an example of what they were looking for for cellulitis, and that's marked primarily by a cobblestoning appearance. So the way that this study worked is that they recorded a yes or no assessment of an abscess after their history and physical exam. And then they did their own point of care ultrasound, so it wasn't blinded and then they re recorded a revised yes or no impression. All the patients with a pre-ultrasound assessment of yes got an IND or a needle aspiration. And um, patients with a pre-ultrasound assessment of no, it was up to physician preference. So after they did their ultrasound, they could make a decision about what they wanted to do. They could either have the patient followed up at seven days by phone and just treat them with outpatient antibiotics, or they could do an IND or needle aspiration if they chose to. And these were the results. So just to go over this briefly, clinical exam was actually fairly sensitive for abscess, so 86%, which is pretty good, I think. The specificity was a little bit lower at 70%, and then when you added point of care ultrasound into the picture, um, your sensitivity went up to 98% and specificity to 88%, so much better. Um, so in this study, point of care ultrasound did increase the diagnostic accuracy for detection of abscesses, and in cases where ultrasound disagreed with the physical exam, um, ultrasound was correct 94% of the time, and I think a good example of that was, uh, this is a one-off case that they reported, but um, one patient had a groin, what was thought to be a groin abscess, so they put the ultrasound probe on it, and it actually turned out to be a pseudoaneurysm, so not a good thing to drain, because um, they saw a pulsatile motion and lack of internal echoes, so I mean that's just an end of one, but it's a, it's a point of where ultrasound can be useful. Um, so 27 patients were lost to follow up, and I think that that's a function of this being kind of a marginalized population. A lot of them didn't have a phone number to follow up. Um, there was no blinding, as I said. 
And we don't really know what happened to the patients after their IND, because, after no IND, I'm sorry, because they were followed up by phone. So, I mean, you're relying on the patient to tell you whether or not their abscess resolved. They weren't, didn't, weren't subjected to repeat physical exam or ultrasound. Um, obviously, it wouldn't have been ethically sound to IND patients who had a negative clinical assessment and a negative ultrasound. So they were sort of stuck with that as their outcome. And also, um, ultrasound picked up a lot of abscesses that were questionably clinically significant. So and one of them was half of a CC. So I don't know. I mean, that could have potentially responded to antibiotics alone, but it was drained. And this is the second study. I'm just going to talk about it very briefly because it's very similar to the first study. Um, but uh, they focused a little more on patients with a clinical cellulitis and no obvious fluid collection. And in this study, point of care ultrasound changed the management in 56% of the cases. So in summary, clinical exam is actually pretty sensitive for abscess detection. We do a pretty good job um, without ultrasound. But ultrasound makes our clinical diagnosis better. And that doesn't say anything about patient outcomes and whether it makes patient outcomes better. I can't say that. But um, it does make our clinical diagnosis better. So maybe the patients for whom this would really provide a benefit would be people who aren't going to follow up. So marginalized populations, you know, psych patients, IV drug users, homeless people. Um, it might be a benefit to know right off the bat what you're dealing with because if they get worse, they may not come back. One of the second uh, questions I had about that case was uh, whether or not I always need empiric MRSA coverage for purulent skin infections. There's actually a lot of studies out there about this. I chose two to talk about briefly. Um, one was in the New England Journal of Medicine. I chose that one because it's very comprehensive. Um, and then the second one I chose because it was done here in London. So it obviously has a lot of implications for our local practice and um, sensitivities here. The New England Journal of Medicine study was a prospective prevalence study of adult skin and soft tissue infections, and they looked at um, emergency departments in 11 U.S. cities, excluded all perirectal abscesses, and swabs of all the purulent sites were cultured. You can see that nice example of an MRSA abscess there. Um, 422 patients were enrolled. MRSA was isolated in 59% of their wound cultures, which is pretty high. Only 7% of the isolates were streptococcal. Um, interestingly, only 27% of patients who came back positive for MRSA in their wounds had risk factors for hospital-acquired MRSA. And that's, that was a clinical um, diagnosis. So these people um, had the absence of, say, um, a hospital admission in the past year or being on dialysis or had an indwelling Foley and other things that you would associate with probably hospital-acquired MRSA. And 99% of the MRSA, MRSA strains when they did genotyping were characteristic of community-acquired strains. Um, in the New England Journal of Medicine study, 100% were susceptible to, susceptible to SEPTRA, and 95% were susceptible to clindamycin, but as we're going to talk about in a minute, that's actually a little bit different in London. 57% of the patients with MRSA infection got antibiotics with no MRSA coverage, but there was actually no difference in outcome between people who had MRSA infection who got uh, in antibiotics that covered MRSA versus those that didn't. And that might be an argument for saying that for a lot of these patients, IND alone was probably sufficient and they may not have needed antibiotics anyway. Um, and that's a finding that's been um, substantiated in other studies as well. So I guess that, that article is good, it's comprehensive, but it doesn't really tell us um, about MRSA and skin and soft tissue infections here. Um, resistance has geographic variations. Um, and bacterial makeup does as well. So I looked at this study as well that was done here. And this was just published this past year. So I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard about this study before, so I'm not going to spend too long on it. But um, it was a prospective observational study of a chief complaint of skin or soft tissue infection in three academic emerges in London. And they excluded um, a small number of patients that had uh, abscesses that would be associated with different kinds of bacteria. So they included things, everything from cellulitis to um, abscesses to ulcers. Um, involved 205 patients, and they did two things. So they defined colonization and infection. So colonization was people who had um, nares or throat cultured for MRSA, and then infection was um, infection sites cultured for MRSA. And they found a bunch of um, predictor variables associated with MRSA infection and colonization, which 
in, there's a bit of overlap there, but in summary, incarceration in the past year, known exposure to MRSA, competitive sports, homelessness, and previous abscess in the past year um, were associated with uh, MRSA colonization or infection. Um, they found that MRSA was the only organism <coughs> isolated in 22% of purulent skin and soft tissue infections, um, but overall about 17% of patients were colonized or infected with MRSA. So quite a few. 71% um, of the patients with MRSA had community acquired MRSA, so that means the absence of risk factors for hospital acquired MRSA, so that's a clinical uh, diagnosis, and 82% of the MRSA isolates uh, by genotyping were characteristic of community acquired. Um, here, 100% again were susceptible to SEPTRA and VANCO, but only 75% were susceptible to clindamycin. Um, about 70% of patients with MRSA got antibiotics with no MRSA coverage, but as we talked about with the, with the New England Journal of Medicine study, if, those, if they were abscesses that got drained, it might not have made that much of a difference for some of them. Um, so the bottom line, I think, for those two studies is that MRSA is responsible for a lot of purulent skin and soft tissue infections, and probably some non-purulent ones as well. Um, but most MRSA skin and soft tissue infections happen in people without any risk factors. So it's a bit hard to decide who warrants MRSA coverage and who doesn't. So I think that the bottom line is that empiric MRSA coverage should be considered in most purulent skin and soft tissue infections. The last question that I had about that particular patient was whether or not we need to use antibiotics for an abscess after IND. And I'm going to talk about um, a... Um, a study that reviewed a bunch of studies and then a study that came out in the same year um, uh, that was not reviewed included in this study. So, um, so in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, um, they looked at six studies. Um, three were RCTs, um, and of the RCTs, one had no blinding or placebo group. One only involved 50 patients, and one had patients who, as part of their treatment, got Caflex, but 52% of their abscesses grew MRSA, so um, it's a bit of a limitation of their study, I guess. And then three cohort studies. Um, and of the three, basically all of them found that there was no difference in resolution after IND for an infection for patients getting antibiotics to which MRSA is resistant versus to which MRSA is susceptible, which would imply that um, it doesn't really matter whether you treat them or not. So in all six studies, there was no difference in resolution for antibiotics versus no antibiotics or antibiotics that weren't effective against your infection after IND. But that doesn't answer a lot of questions, so they didn't tease out who had overlying cellulitis and who didn't. And what if we tried to treat patients with antibiotics MRSA is susceptible to, would that include our success rates? Improve, sorry, our excess success rates? So this study looked at that, um, and came out the same year. So it was a retrospective cohort study of community-acquired MRSA skin and soft tissue infections done in Arkansas. So they only included patients in their study who cultured positive for MRSA. Um, included everything from culturable cellulitis to abscesses. Excluded anything really minor like impetigo. Um, excluded anything major with an underlying disorder like osteomyelitis. And they defined treatment failure as infection worsening after two days and greater than one of requiring a second IND, hospital admission, a new skin and soft tissue infection, or a microbiologic failure, which was culture of MRSA from a wound after they completed their antibiotics. Their um, time zero from where their two days started was the time at which the IND was performed for most of them. About 20% of the patients didn't get IND, so that time zero was when their wound was cultured. So like I said, 80% had an IND. Therapy failed in 5% of the active antibiotic group and 13% of the inactive antibiotic group, which was a significant difference. So active antibiotics were antibiotics um, that had activity against MRSA. So that would suggest that treating MRSA abscesses with antibiotics after IND may prevent treatment failure. But 20% didn't get an IND. So I guess the bottom line is that MRSA abscesses may benefit from antibiotics but there's been no large randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial done, so it's really still up to clinical judgment. Yeah. Heather, that, um, you said there was failure. It looked like that was a composite outcome in uh, four different, it could have been one of the four different That's right. items, and one of those was microbiological failure, yes. which is always very questionable. Mm -hmm. Do you know what percentage of those quote, failures were microbiological failures, which are clinical failures? I don't, and I don't think it said it in the study because I don't recall reading it. So I don't know the answer to that. 
So the second case that um, I'm going to talk about was a uh, healthy 39-year-old male. Um, he presented to a community eMERGE complaining of a red and painful left arm for the past three days. So sounds kind of like the last guy. No trauma associated with it. He'd already been on outpatient ceftriaxone for three days in the community. Um, it's febrile, still feels unwell. His erythema is spreading, and this is what it looked like. So you can see the different lines where people have kind of drawn things over the past few days, and it continues to spread beyond borders. And that made me question, um, in this era of community-acquired MRSA, um, do, are we still looking at the same bacteria causing diffuse non-culturable cellulitis? And there's two studies that have come out recently looking at that. Well, a review and a study, I should say. So um, this uh, study looked at the role of beta hemolytic strep in causing diffuse non-culturable cellulitis, and that came out uh, a couple of years ago. So it's a prospective study at a California uh, county hospital, and they had 248 patients with diffuse non-culturable cellulitis. So not associated with some kind of purulent wound that you could culture. Um, they excluded people who had um, perineal, periorbital, or groin locations. Anybody who could have had an opportunistic infection, like people with neutropenia. Um, different bugs involved, so animal or human bites. Um, underlying uh, uh, disorder like osteomyelitis. Um, and they also excluded people that had a soft tissue infection or pharyngitis in the past year because um, the way that they determined who had had beta hemolytic strep was by doing serology, so that would have potentially interfered with that. And the way that they figured out who had which organisms in non-culturable cellulitis was a bit of a roundabout way. So they looked at anti-streptolysin O antibodies and anti-DNAs B antibodies measured at baseline and then two to 12 weeks later. So ASO measures, um, um, those antibodies are antibodies to group A strep, group C strep, and group G strep. And ADB uh, are antibodies to group A strep. So they also, um, sorry, I should say that um, typically an in infection, um, your uh, titers should rise within about two weeks and then start to decline about three to six months later. So it should be a parent who has an infection because they're it should be a certain amount of rise, and then they should be above the upper limit of normal for adults on their second titer. Um, and only 2 to 5% of normal adults would have titers over the number that they um, had as their upper limit of normal. They also uh, looked at blood cultures as well to kind of capture the people who had group B strep because they weren't using um, antibodies that could look at group B strep. So their secondary outcome was looking at response to beta-lactams, um, and that was analyzed by assessing clinical improvement after greater than 48 hours of treatment. Um, but, uh, sorry, they, so the physicians were asked to use gram-positive beta-lactams, and for the most part, they complied with that. So um, most patients, 83%, were treated with cefazolin. Um, most of the rest were treated with oxacillin. And then a handful of patients got things like PENG, ceftriaxone, clavulin, um, piptazo. Um, so that response to beta-lactams could only be done because they weren't determining who got what treatment. So that response could only be measured in people who were not covered for MRSA. <coughs> so they only measured response to beta-lactams in people who'd gotten one dose or less of MRSA covering antibiotics. So they could get one dose of an MRSA active antibiotic in the emergency department, but that was it. So there was 248 patients enrolled. Um, 69 cases had to be dropped. Um, they couldn't be assessed for a repeat serology because they were lost to follow up. So they might have completed their initial hospital stay of 48 hours or whatever, so they could be assessed for a beta-lactam response, but because they never showed up to get their repeat serology done, we don't know what they were infected with. Um, so 179 people had a complete evaluation, and 131 of those were positive for beta-hemolytic strep. So everybody was assessed for a beta-lactam response, but they had to drop a significant number of people who were unevaluable because um, they got less than 48 hours of treatment, i.e. they left AMA or were discharged early, um, mm -hmm. or they got more than one dose of an antibiotic with MRSA. So you can see that the people who actually um, were assessed for beta-lactam response, largely it was successful. So there were very few treatment failures, even in the group that wasn't positive for beta-hemolytic strep. 
but there were a lot of unevaluable patients. So at the end, 73% um, of patients had a beta hemolytic strep infection. 96% responded to beta lactams successfully. Um, and that includes the group of beta hemolytic strep negative patients. There's obviously some issues um, with interpretation of this study. So positive serology doesn't include co-infections. So some of these infections could have been um, polymicrobial. There was a very large unevaluable group of patients. And I don't know, Dr. John can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that serology doesn't that serology doesn't necessarily mean the infection itself was caused by beta hemolytic strep. Maybe it was caused by something else that just provided a portal of entry in the skin for beta hemolytic strep. Maybe that wasn't the original pathogen. Um, so even in the era of community-acquired MRSA, beta hemolytic strep may be still the most common cause of diffuse non-culturable cellulitis. So this is a study that came out the same year with kind of a conflicting point of view. And... Um, this was a systematic review of the etiology of cellulitis with intact skin, so kind of a similar group of people. Um, and they looked at studies that had used needle aspiration or punch biopsy to try to culture um, people's cellulitis where there wasn't anything that was culturable. So they, again, excluded similar people, so ocular odontogenic um, infections, anything deep tissue or involving another organ, which they defined as an abscess or osteomyelitis. Any things that were thought to be contaminants, like staph epidermis, were excluded. Um, and anything involving a skin break was excluded as well. So in the end, they were left with 808 patients in total from 16 articles. 127 had positive cultures, 65 of which grew Staph aureus, 35 grew group A strep. A very small number grew other beta hemolytic strep. So the most common etiology of cellulitis in this study was actually Staph aureus. However, most cultures yielded no organism, so the vast majority yielded no organism. So maybe the real culprit is just more difficult to obtain or culture. Some of the studies were older, so we can't really make any comment about the proportion of them that were MRSA because it was before that proportion would have been higher. Um, so I think that the bottom line is that even in this era of community-acquired MRSA, probably most non-culturable cellulitis is still caused by MSSA and group A strep. So it, what they suggest in that, those articles is to start with a beta-lactam and then broaden coverage if treatment failure at two days. Um, and patients, ba patients allergic to beta-lactams could maybe just start with um, clindamycin, since that has um, some MRSA coverage. I guess another approach is to treat people with risk factors or those more likely to fail treatment. You could broaden their coverage empirically. So um, I think most of us were at research day when Danny was talking about uh, uh, his research about uh, factors independently associated with treatment failure, which included uh, fever at triage, leg ulcers, edema or lymphedema, and a prior cellulitis in the same area. So I guess that's another approach that we could do. Um, the last question I had was um, whether or not uh, ceftriaxone is a good choice for moderate to severe cellulitis. It's kind of a hard question to answer because there's not, I couldn't find any studies directly assessing its efficacy in adults. Um, and for those of you that have done um, Hulk, you'll know that our surgical colleagues don't really agree with our use of ceftriaxone because it doesn't have um, good gram positive coverage. <laughs> so. Um, it's a third generation cephalosporin. So first generation cephalosporins like ANSA theoretically should have better gram positive coverage. So that's why I wanted to look into this. If the majority of cellulitis is still caused by beta hemolytic strep and MSSA, then it might make more sense to choose something with better gram positive coverage. But as I'm gonna talk about clinically, that's not really how it turns out. So um, this was, um, a Sentry uh, antimicrobial surveillance <laughs> program um, study, and it looked at about 12,000 strains of staph and strep that were obtained in Canada and the US, and then it tested their sensitivity to ceftriaxone and 12 other antibiotics. So it's a pretty big undertaking. These uh, samples were isolated from a variety of different places, unfortunately, not just skin. So to kind of take that into account, I guess. Um, and they looked at susceptibility in vitro. So almost 100% of the beta hemolytic strep in this study were susceptible to ceftriaxone. Only 60% of staph aureus, 
some of which would have been MRSA, so it's not, I don't think that's a really surprising finding. 53% of coag negative staph, like, for example, staph epidermidis, and then about 90% of viridins group streptococci, which I think is a pretty low virulence um, organism for most people who are not immune suppressed. So in vitro susceptibility doesn't necessarily translate to in vivo, so numbers might actually be lower in vivo. Um, both MSSA and MRSA strains were used, and we wouldn't expect ceftriaxone to have any action against MRSA. Um, not all organisms will, will be necessarily representative of those found in SSTIs either, because they were cultured from a variety of different places. So um, in vivo, um, there's, a, there's a few different studies that look at ANSEF and compare it to ceftriaxone in a clinical setting. Um, I picked this one just because it was the most uh, recent that I could find. And it compared uh, ANSEF plus probenicid to um, ceftriaxone plus placebo in the treatment of moderate to severe cellulitis in adults. So this was a randomized double-blind equivalence trial on 134 cases of moderate to severe cellulitis in Australia. And uh, they defined their cellulitis as recent off onset soft tissue erythema with more than one of pain, swelling, lymphangitis, fever, and ulceration with or without discharge. So they excluded patients that could just get oral antibiotics in the opinion of the treating physician. Um, any nosocomial infections were excluded. Any patients that were really sick were excluded, so septic shock, bacteremia. Um, again, they excluded osteomyelitis. Um, any patients socially unsuitable for home treatment were excluded as well, and patients with uh, kidney or liver issues. Um, so they randomized patients to ANSEF 2 grams IV plus probenicid a gram PO or ceftriaxone a gram IV plus placebo <coughs> PO. And ANSEF and ceftriaxone are, I think one is yellow and one is clear. I can't remember which is which. But anyways, they put masking tape around the bags of um, IV solution to hide them. And then they gave people pills that looked like probenicid. And they had um, two points at which they assessed patients <coughs> for a cure. So um, at the end of IV therapy, cure was defined as resolution of signs and symptoms needing no antibiotic therapy or oral therapy alone. And then they reassessed them at a one-month follow-up visit, and cure was defined as no recurrence at the same site. So 18 cases were considered indeterminate, and that, those were mostly people uh, who actually had exclusion criteria but it didn't become apparent until later. So they had an underlying osteomyelitis or their true diagnosis was DVT. They were never infected to begin with. Three patients were lost to follow-up. So at the end of the day, 113 cases were included in their one-month follow-up. So cure at the end of therapy was 96% in the ceftriaxone group and 86% of the ANSEF group. That was not a significant difference between the two. And cure at one month was very similar. Again, not a significant difference between the two. So very similar. So I guess the study was assigned to assess the equivalence of ceftriaxone to ANSEF, not so much the um, efficacy of ceftriaxone per se. It's not a Canadian study either, so it might not represent our bugs and resistance to our bugs. Um, and I wasn't really sure about this. Um, most of the patients that I've seen that have been at urgent care, for example, maybe get like three doses of IV antibiotics and then they're kind of transitioned to PO. But the average um, mean number of doses in the ANSEF group was seven and the ceftriaxone group was six, which seemed like a lot to me. Um, it's not really clear whether abscesses were included. Um, so this is um, one of the studies I found looking at outpatient ceftriaxone management. Unfortunately, it's not in adults. So like I said, I couldn't, couldn't find one, but this study was done in Montreal on treating kids as outpatients with uh, skin and soft tissue infections using ceftriaxone. Um, they treated kids with moderate to severe cellulitis, and they defined that as the treating physician thought that they required antibiotics, IV, in the emergency department. They excluded any really sick kids, toxic kids, immunosuppressed kids. Um, kids with any significant comorbidity were excluded. Um, kids that would have had unusual bugs, so animal bites were excluded. Anything really rapidly progressing, so they felt was maybe not appropriate for outpatient management, was excluded as well. So um, these kids got ceftriaxone. And if they were panallergic, they got clindamycin. 
very few of them actually ended up getting clindamycin. Most of them got ceftriaxone. Um, and then they were stepped down to Keflex PO in the ceftriaxone group. And once they were non-febrile, and the cellulitis had decreased by 75%, or they were stepped down to Clinda PO in the Clinda group, and that was just at physician discretion. There wasn't really um, specific endpoints that they were looking for. So most of them got, ended up getting the ceftriaxone, not the clindamycin. And about 79% of them were successfully discharged from the day treatment center after three days of therapy IV onto PO antibiotics and home. Um, there was a failure rate of about 21%. Um, so by failure, I mean they were, ended up being admitted to hospital. But um, only 12% of the total um, had uncompl uncomplicated cellulitis and failed treatment. So the rest were all admitted for other issues. And you can see that on this table. So um, their evolution was deemed unsatisfactory at the day treatment center. There are the ones that, that failed outpatient management of cellulitis legitimately on ceftriaxone and had to be admitted. Um, but a lot of the others failed for other reasons. Um, parental incapacity to comply with day treatment care, um, tr day treatment center treatment, um, or they had an abscess that had to be drained, um, other medical issues they needed to be admitted for, things like that. So obviously kids might harbor different bacteria than adults. Some um, adults may be more likely to have MRSA. So it's hard to make generalizations, I think, from this study to an adult population necessarily. There might be a lower threshold, I think, too, to admit kids to hospital because they're failing therapy than there would be for adults. So it was hard for me to draw any conclusions from the literature that was available out there. Um, I think some treatment failures are really inevitable no matter what we use. Um, but it should be noted that none of the kids in that Montreal study had a bad outcome. So the ones that failed management and ended up being hospitalized, they were all discharged and had no uh, long-term morbidity as a result, um, according to the study, although they didn't follow them up for, for very long. So um, we don't really have a better alternative, I think, because uh, it's been shown that cefzol and probenicid is probably equivalent to ceftriaxone. So not much I could really draw from that. Um, so in summary, point of care ultrasounds improves diagnosis of abscesses in the emergency department. Um, empiric MRSA coverage should be considered in most purulent skin and soft tissue infections. Um, the London study um, showed MRSA as a sole pathogen in 22%, but that, um, that included some cultured cellulitis without abscess. I wasn't really sure what that meant. But um, the rate of MRSA in non-purulent cellulitis and unculturable cellulitis is not really known in London, so I can't really make any comments about that. Um, it's not really clear whether abscesses benefit from antibiotics after IND, and uh, ceftriaxone has similar rates of treatment failure as ANCEF in outpatient management of cellulitis. So that's it. comment on our, our sort of local susceptibility numbers or MICs and in particular the issue about ANSEF versus CEFTRAX or what Heather talked about. Cool. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. It was actually a great presentation. I, I just wanted to say that anti-DNA retesting is not available anywhere in Canada. So, so, and we actually had a request for it just yesterday, so I just wanted to tell you that. Um, you can certainly do ASLT tests, but it's, it's usually done sort of retrospectively for people looking for post-streptococcal neurological syndromes and things like that. But, but I do think in, in those two studies, uh, the study that looked at the stre uh, streptococcal serology um, is, is probably a much better study than the sort of follow-up literature review. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, I'm, I, I'm quite happy that diffuse cellulitis is the majority of the time caused by you know, group A, uh, it was sort of baby hemolytic streptococci anyway. And uh, the reason for that is the streptococci produce all these enzymes that enable them to spread through tissues, you know, the streptolysis and the DNAs, the hyaluronidase, all those sort of things. Whereas staphs produce enzymes that kill white cells and they form abscesses. So. Um, the, I, I don't think the surgeons in the whole unit are actually correct about the the poor gram positive activity of ceftriaxone. And the, uh, you know, if you were talking about ceftazidine dime as a, a third generation ceftosporin, that would be absolutely true. It, it has somewhat poor uh, gram positive activity in first and second generation. But ceftriaxone's got pretty decent anti-staphylococcal activity. 
it's got very good any cerebral cocktail activity. So, um, you know, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I used to treat meningitis because of strep pneumonia, and, and it actually has better activity against uh, penicillin um, or partially penicillin resistant strep pneumonia than first generations have cerebrals do. So, I don't think there's anything wrong. In, and, and, and it's sort of interesting that the beta hemolytic streps have never become, uh, group A beta hemolytic streps have never become resistant to penicillin. You know, it's like syphilis. This is the antibiotic that's been around for the longest time. It's been used to treat syphilis and, and you know, group A strep infections ever since it's been around. And yet we've never seen a single resistant isolate. So, so, so that 99.8%, I'm not quite sure about the 0.2% because there's never been a, a published case of resistance to uh, a beta lactam amongst uh, beta hemolytic strep. The staph, it's true. You, you could probably say the MICs to, to staphylococci are you know, a little better with first generation cephalosporins than uh, third generation. But safe products are like, like um, uh, it actually has pretty decent anti cephalococcal activity, and, and, and I, you, you certainly can't say that it's not a, a good anti cephalococcal drug. I think the, the motivation for a lot of these studies was probably when CEF triaxone cost a lot of money. And, you know, and so there was often a, a, a cost benefit to going with ANSEF plus probenicid because CEF triaxone was expensive. But now that generic CEF triaxone is around, that doesn't really apply that much anymore, I don't think. Um, and, I, you know, I think there are certain situations where CEF triaxone might actually be advantageous. And so in the diabetic, for example, you know, where there might be grand negatives and other organisms involved, um, in children, actually, because of um, Haemophilus as a cause of skin and soft tissue infection. I, you know, I realize that group B Haemophilus is a lot less common since we've had Hinbanks disease and so on, but still, uh, Haemophilus is a cause of skin and soft tissue infection. And also, you know, if there's any contact with water or, or animal bites, you know, where you have other organs which should all be covered by Ceftriaxon, but not by Ansem, actually. So, so the only issue really is, um, uh, is, is if there's MRSA and, and, uh, and in a diffuse cellulitis, I think the chances of there being MRSA are a lot less likely. You, you of course, do get mixed infections. And, and, and I think the results of sort of culture information are, are, are sometimes difficult to interpret even in that setting because when you think that you know, 30% of us are carriers of Staph aureus and therefore have our skin colonized with Staph aureus. If you had a, a cellulitis caused by uh, a group A strep, um, you could still, if you were to try and, and take cultures, um, you could culture Staph aureus as a skin <coughs> contaminant, in fact, in that situation. So I, I, I don't know. Although, you know, certainly with Impetigo, you can get mixed cultures and we know Staph aureus is the most common cause. Which has changed. I mean, it used to be group A strep. But, um, so, yeah. Um, that, that answers any answer. I was yeah. one question. Um, IV versus IM ceftriaxone. Because some of our population, um, the nurses complain they're difficult, difficult folks to get IVs in, and some of those same patients are ones that we don't want to send home with IVs, particularly if they're yeah. IV drug users. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a difference? I don't think the way it gets in the bug doesn't know how it got in there. I don't think it makes any difference at all. It's a painful show, no, but you give it a light of can. And, you know, I, I suppose the one argument that you can make is you always sort of say, you know, you should treat with as narrow spectrum an antibiotic as possible. And so if ANSEF is covering uh, strep and staph, why add, you know, the sort of gram negative cover that CEF triaxone has as well? But, you know, I'm not sure that this is going to be a cause of massive antibiotic resistance. And we're going to have to start giving this to everyone with gonorrhea soon too, anyway, because of suffixing. Yes? Michael, along that line of uh, uh, bioavailability, can you comment on kind of some of the antibiotics we use and whether we really need to be giving them intravenously? Specifically, kind of thinking of clindamycin. Uh, yeah, so clindamycin, septra, metronidazole, you know, I mean, they're all just as, or oh, linezolid, um, you know, 
I'm sure she must have a lot of women there, isn't it? Because the <laughs> pharmacy would, would, would be all over you. But, but, but you know, those are all so well uh, by a bad orally that there's really no need to use that. Right. Well, one antibiotic which you can use, when we were talking about the community acquired MRSAs that wasn't actually mentioned, is doxycycline. Doxycycline has quite good activity against MRSA, like our hospital acquired and community acquired MRSAs are susceptible to doxycycline almost universally. Uh, so, so, you know, if you, if you have a, a, a case or you think that MRSA, uh, there's, you know, a reasonable chance of being an MRSA or you think a community acquired MRSA, doxycycline is quite a reasonable antibiotic to use. So it's a good antibiotic to use, actually. Yeah. More expensive though. Than, than say tetracycline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, I, I, I actually don't know anything about the cost. I, because my, my <laughs> clinical practice, my, no, 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 but my clinical practice at STD clinic now. So and and the province provides everything free of charge to us. So I have no idea of cost of anything. Of course, your docs is not covered on the OEB, yeah, right? Yeah, That's, uh, oh, I don't know how expensive it is, but it's yeah. not covered by the oh, drug benefit okay. plan for whatever reason. Yeah. yeah. Question: um, Do you know if um, IV Anzac once a day with probenicid is equivalent to around the clock IV Anzac. And if that's the case, how come the former is not being used on an inpatient basis? Yeah, I honestly don't know. You know, I think, I think one of the things in hospitals, people have IVs for all sorts of reasons. And so the IV is just often there, you know, and so it gets used. Um, and it's not unlike, we don't use single daily dosing of aminoglycosides much in our hospitals either. Um, so, and again, I think it's because everybody has an IV and, you know, people get concerned about sort of giving big doses and so, you know, I just think it's something people probably aren't that familiar with. You could probably run an education campaign and get everyone to, to change to that. Um, it, it, it depends. I, I, I actually, I, I'm not familiar with the pharmacokinetics of, of that and whether the, the importance with beta-lactam antibiotics is that they should stay above the minimum inhibitory concentration for that organism for 60% of the time or more. So, so that's the deal. If, if, if ANSEF with probenicid keeps levels of ANSEF in your blood for more than 60 minutes above the MIC for staph and strep, and for strep it would be easy because the MIC would be very low. Uh, it's, it's okay to use. Um, and, and so that's why with some organisms, um, they will use sort of, now actually use continuous infusions of, of beta-lactams with where MICs are sort of going up with the two, two uh, antibiotics. But I mean, you could probably do it. I just don't think it's practical, you know. It's, it's I mean, the thing about ANSEF is easy to give. You can give it as a push. It's, you know, it's not a, a difficult thing technically to give something to the pharmacy, probably just send up mags and some people who will have IVs. There is a study looking at three times daily and sub versus septriaxel. It was from like 1980, so I didn't review it in detail after that, but they did find no difference between the lives. There was a study looking at. What was the outcome? There was no difference. No difference. In some of the review of your papers, did, you, did they comment on sort of the standard of care of abscess drainage uh, with respect to packing versus no packing? I didn't look into that in detail. Um, they weren't sort of commenting? And didn't no, kind of no, not the ones that I looked at. But I did find, uh, interestingly, an article just came out um, that reviewed, I think, about 900 patients. Because in some areas of the world, I gather, it's normal to primarily close abscesses after drainage. And they actually found there was no difference in recurrence between abscesses that were primarily closed and those that were left to heal by secondary intent, which is kind of interesting. Those studies weren't done in North America. Okay. Michael, could you comment? I believe in Europe they've moved more towards the single once once a day dosing for well, certainly for uh, group A strep uh, throat. Um, now we're moving away from antibiotics for older patients for that period, but. <clears throat> Is, can you explain the, the, the theory of that in terms of how long the, the uh, bacteria are inhibited after a single <coughs> use of appropriate antibiotic? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the sort of post-antibiotic effect, that, or so the time after you've treated them with an antibiotic, that you don't get division of the bacteria differs actually, depending on whether the bacteria are gram positive, and differ depending on the antibiotic you've got. So it's very sort of specific for the organism and the antibiotic. So aminoglycosides, for example, have a very good post-antibiotic effect against gram-negative bacteria, and so that's why you can go for that once daily dosing, and even though it might fall, levels might fall below the MIC, it falls down enough that you can clear aminoglycosides out of your renal cells and do away with the renal toxicity, but you still inhibit the bacteria for hours and hours and hours before they start reviving again. But, but with beta-lactams um, and gram-positives, there's actually a quite a short post-antibiotic effect. Um, I, I, I don't know, what, the, the pharyngitis studies, I'm not sure, I, I know they're single-dose azithromycin studies, for example. Uh, we just give a gram of azithromycin to treat uh, group A beta um, um pharyngitis. Um, those studies were published, and I, you know, I'm not a night, I suppose, treating chlamydia. Single dose of azithromycin. Do you single dose azithromycin in kids? I'm not sure. Not yet. I wanted to mention too, Dr. John was talking about um, the cost of ceftriaxone and it ends up being one of the barriers to using ceftriaxone in the past. At LHSC, ceftriaxone costs two dollars and eighty-eight cents um, for two grams, and um, ANCEP is ninety-four cents. So when you add the probenecid in, they're actually almost equal. And ceftriaxone would have cost thirty-five dollars or more, I think, a couple of years back before the generic arrived. So that's that's really quite cheap. Uh, sometimes we uh, we see people who are on a combination of IV antibiotics plus PO, and I've seen you know, ceftriaxone plus Keflex, and I've seen ceftriaxone plus Ceftra, um, and I think some of that is more recent to try and cover the MRSA with a PO antibiotic that's well absorbed, like Ceftra or clindamycin. Um, could you comment on that kind of uh, a regimen? Because you remember the the Ceftra has very good activity against community acquired MRSA. Unfortunately, one of the sort of gaps in Septra's activity is against streptococci. So, you know, if you think there's a high likelihood of there being a sort of a, uh, a streptococcal infection as well, you'll need streptococcal cover. Um, yeah, I suppose it depends a little bit on the clinical presentation and how much you suspect there. Um, or whether these are people covering what they think are streptococcal infections with perhaps there being a community-wide MRSA. Right. It, it, it's difficult to know. Um, like, like the data from the study here is very useful for you guys working in the emergence because it tells you, um, you know, the, the sort of prevalence of, of community-wide MRSA in patients who prevent to, present to you with skin and soft tissue infections. I think it overestimates the amount of community-acquired MRSA out of the community or what, because so many people who are going to be at risk for community-acquired MRSA don't have family doctors, so they use you guys as their, you know, when things really go wrong and they, you know, get a significant infection, they come to the emergence. So I think, you know, there's, there's, it, it, it really overestimates the uh, um, incidence of, community-acquired MRSA. Now, that, that wouldn't be the case if you went to Saskatchewan or Alberta, uh, where there's a lot more community-acquired MRSA, but, but and a lot of that is in First Nation communities, actually. And sometimes different types, so, so the, the uh, strain is different there as well. It's the CMRSA-7, which was the one we had here was all CMRSA-10, which the, the there's two strains in the U.S. mostly, and it's the USA 300, I think they call it. It's the <coughs> most common one we see. With regard to the development of the C. difficile enterocolitis, yeah. is there a difference between the uh, oral versus IV administration of clindamycin? I don't think so, no. In fact, I think you can get it intravaginal treating BV with uh, clindamycin. As well, because clindamycin is so well absorbed that it's sort of like flagell. You know, we used to get flagell, well, 
showing my age, but in South Africa we used to use suppositories of flagell because it was the cheapest route to give it and, and it got it. And in those days flagell only came in glass bottles because you couldn't put it in plastic bottles. And so it was an incredibly expensive drug to give ID. Um, and, you know, so I, I don't think the root of the drug really matters. The, the thing with C. diff, though, is age, you know. Uh, it, 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 C. diff is probably a pretty safe drug to use in young people. I mean, you'll get the occasional people who will still get C. diff colitis. But, you know, when you hit 60 and go over 60, your chances of getting C. diff colitis just go up enormously, and your chances of having poor outcomes go up enormously. It, it makes a big, big difference um, the older you are. And the number of antibiotics, you know, as you add the number of antibiotics you get exposed to, so you, you know, become, if you've, if you've been on three antibiotics, I think you're 15 times more likely to get C. diff than someone who had just one antibiotic. But in the young population, which, which is actually the population we often see right. with this kind of a yeah, problem, yeah, I, think, I think it's, it's a much safe. safer drug to use in the population that you, you see. And you get it orally. I mean, you, uh, I think that's it. You see people on IV clindamycin, and sometimes they scratch your head and say, like, there's really no advantage to using IV clindamycin. Um, the other thing we often see is I think people are pushed to start IV <coughs> therapy when somebody comes back, you know, 36 hours later, and it's a little bit, quote, worse. Um, and they're a failure of PO, and then people feel compelled to have to start, to have to do something different. Um, and I think that's where this regimen is sort of IV septriaxone plus a, a really good PO antibiotic like clindamycin might be an effective strategy that keeps the patients happy and keeps us happy. And, and certainly early on with a diffuse cellulitis, you know, streptococcal cellulitis, I mean, you know how, like the first 24 hours, it always looks worse. But So the important thing is to speak to the patient to find out if they feel better, if the pain's better, if the fever's gone, you know, and if you can get a white cell count and so you know those are so much more reliable than the erythema and drawing the lines. I mean that's you know, the first 48 hours you're talking yeah. towards. Yeah. yeah. While we're on the topic of clindamycin not directly related to SSTIs, but uh, uh, is there any rationale in using clindamycin for oral or uh, sort of neck infections um, yeah. that are originating from an oral organism? Yeah. Is there any rationale in using clindamycin yeah. in that situation? Mm -hmm. or, uh, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 you can get anaerobes in the head and neck that are penicillin resistant, although, um, you know, there's always sort of talk about above and below the diaphragm. So you're less likely to get Vectoris <coughs> fragilis, which is the, the, the most common anaerobe that's going to be penicillin resistant uh, above uh, in the head and neck. But you can. Um, yeah, it, it's sort of unfortunate that, that Upjohn have very heavily promoted the use of, of clindamycin with dentists. So if you see people who have been to the dentist and had any sort of dental abscess or anything like that, they often get put on, on clindamycin. And, and I remember a little old lady um, who was sort of a frequent flyer in the hospital because she you know, had some sort of cardiac complaint, uh, went, you know, I think she had a, uh, a murmur prolapsing mitral valve or something, but she wasn't really a candidate for prophylaxis went to a dentist, was given clindamycin for prophylaxis to spend a month in UH, yeah, a lot of it in the ICU with colitis, you know, and she was sort of 89 years old or something. And, and, and so, you know, you, you still do have to, particularly in that population, I think be quite careful. Um, we see, we get pushed a lot by, uh, by our oral surgery, surgery colleagues and by our ENT colleagues to start clindamycin as a first choice yeah. uh, for patients with uh, infections in, yeah. in the throat. And, and I know they want to do a study actually looking at that at one of the residents at the moment actually. Would it not make more sense yes. to be adding uh, metronidazole and, uh, if we're worried yeah, about you it? Could. I, mean, you could. I mean, there's, there's really, the, the, if you have a penicillin or metronidazole, it would easily be as effective as clindamycin. Um, and metronidazole is not great against gram-positive anaerobes, but it's great against gram-negative anaerobes. But penicillin is great against all the gram-positive anaerobes. So, so you know, it gives good color. Amoxiclav is a is another great. 
MoxClab. You, do you guys use a lot of MoxClab or is it not available on the uh, yeah, yeah. vehicle? Is it for yeah. animal bites? Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. So it's great because the, the mixed anaerobic flora covers a lot of the, the you know, obviously staff and strep. Are you suggesting a box class for like head and neck kind of? Well, it, it, it's perfectly reasonable antibiotic to use in sort of oral yeah. abscesses and things like that as well. I must say, and, and and certainly in older patients, it might be a better choice than clindamycin. I, 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 I worked last evening, and we actually, um, Monica and actually had a, a patient who was 80, she 80? 80, 80 years old, 82, who had a, a, an abscess, uh, a neck abscess, and we had ENT come and see her, um, and, and they suggested clindamycin. So, you know, from your talk this morning, talking about the, the issue of age yeah. and C If you're 90 years old, you're a hundred times more likely to get C. diff than someone who's 20 years old. You know, it, it, it's, it makes a huge difference. <laughs> and, 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 you know, so. <laughs> and, and, you know, and we, we actually take part in a study every year where we, we collect C. diff isolates for a two month period. Um, on everyone who gets, these are only hospital wide cases of CDF, we send them to the National Micro Lab to check the strains and look for the gene lesion thing. But, but it's interesting, when, when, when I look at the Excel database with, with all the patients' names in there, the birth dates are all 927, 931, 9, you know, they're all old patients. They, it's, it's, they're just hugely overrepresented. So, you know, I, th I think clindamycin is a great drug, and, 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 uh, but you really do have to be a little in the older patient. And certainly if you use it, I think you need to warn patients, you know, should they develop diarrhea, that they should, you know, seek medical care immediately because they, they need to be tested so they can be treated early. You know, some older people will sit around until they dehydrate themselves. Thank you.